over the months, rumours have been coming through from one project after another about incredible things being found or incredible thoughts being thought. Uh, there was the account that uh, maybe the monastic precinct at Glastonbury might be Iron Age. There was the Roman army at Silchester, the Wasda. There were exotic plants coming in in the late Iron Age at Silchester. Even I got infected and found I'd accidentally become a Romanist in Aberdeenshire. Then the real rumours started, coming from Kent. And of course the exciting one is the enormous Mesolithic site. <laughs> 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 which I won't be talking about at all. <laughs> most unfortunately, it was disturbed by something which sounds like an Anglo-Saxon palace. And actually that is really not the more exciting. <laughs> so here he is, our very own devil who's come nearly 100 metres. <laughs> and, uh, Anglo-Saxon. <coughs> thank you, thank you, Richard. Well, well, wonderful turnout. Thank you all for coming to hear about uh, uh, latest <coughs> discoveries at Limage. And I say latest discoveries because I have actually presented to this seminar series before, um, all the way back, I think, in 2009, if I'm not mistaken, which was just after our first open area excavation um, in the village. So. What I'm going to be doing is, is very much an update on what's been happening since then and, and how the story of the archaeology of Limage has evolved. But just for the benefit of those that don't have that uh, background knowledge, um, just something about the genesis of the project. Now, those of the audience that were privileged to be present at my job application interview, um, <laughs> well, the presentation that went alongside the interview in GO8, well, you might remember it. Apparently I was told that it was memorable for the fact that I shouted. <laughs> I, I put this down to the amazing kind of, uh, I don't know, sort of, something about GO8. There's something quite mystical about it. It doesn't help me project your voice. It's down to me personally. But that was the most memorable part of that uh, presentation, apparently. But if you were there, you'll remember that I showed a slide, this is back in 2007, um, where I said that I was just about to dip my toe in the archaeology of this new site called Limage. The previous work had really been done there subsequently. And I was going to do some test fitting and geophysics and just kind of just assess what was happening there. Um, that season of preliminary work, um, you can see we've got some slides of that, that, that work going on. And, um, yeah, there's a bit of extreme archaeology happening in 2007, um, was, was very successful, um, and that really provided the results, spurred a, a, a three-season campaign of open area excavation, um, partly funded by a joint field school with UCLA California, and that, 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 that campaign um, was completed um, in 2010. Subsequently, I've been very lucky to, to receive funding from the AHRC to fund another three-year campaign of excavation on a new site within the village. Um, and I'm privileged to have a sort of a team to help me in that process. Um, and here I just want to make reference to some of the project members, including the PDRA, Alexandra Knox, sitting there. Um, and we also have a dedicated data manager, Simon, who many of you um, may know. We also have a dedicated PhD examining the zoo archaeology, the animal bones um, from the project. And that's Zoe at the back there. Not <laughs> yourself. Um, so we've got a team of people in place who are also collaborating um, with local archaeologists to undertake this work, so the Canterbury Archaeological Trust, who are the main professional contractors in Kent, and the Kent Archaeological Society, um, and through these contacts we're organising a series of educational outreach initiatives to really, you know, try and involve the local community um, as much as possible in the work that we're doing. So it's a really exciting um, new phase. Lots of more work that, that, that's going to be done. I'll, I'll talk about the, the, the future of the project right at the very end. 
But one of the things that you're probably asking yourself is, well, why keep going back to this single village in Kent? Um, you've been going there since 2008. Surely the archaeology is exhausted. Why don't you just move on and dig somewhere else? Well, the reason why we do keep going back is that every time we do, the results get more and more interesting, more and more exciting, and the story that we're able to produce gets more and more detailed. Indeed. <laughs> what more can I say? <laughs> I think what's particularly, just to put you in the picture right at the outset, I think what's particularly interesting and important about this site and the work that we're doing is the narrative that it's producing. A narrative about a site and a community and an Anglo-Saxon landscape. How that changed over time in relation to key processes um, that we associate with the Anglo-Saxon conversion and really one of the key um, sort of mechanisms for the conversion to Christianity in England was um, monasticism, the establishment of monastic foundations. And I think that's what the real contribution this project is able to make. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So something about the more general academic and research context to this project. One of the most significant cultural turning points um, in early English history was the conversion to Christianity. This was a drawn out process um, that, that, that spanned two, three hundred years from the 6th to the 9th centuries <coughs> AD. <coughs> Monastic foundation was absolutely crucial. It spearheaded the process of Christianization. And from what we know from historical sources, it's a top-down process in the sense that monasteries were founded through the largesse of royal courts um, and eventually by a broader spectrum of the Anglo-Saxon aristocracy. Now, documented monastic institutions of this period that we hear about in key narratives like Bede's ecclesiastical history have long been a target for archaeological research and it's particularly the core buildings and church complexes um, that are, are particularly well known and studied. Having said that, and as these quotes from recent literature make clear, there are clear gaps in our understanding of science. There are biases, in other words, which mean, means that we know much more about the core complexes of monastic um, communities and settlements, and we know much more about the buildings and the claustral ranges than we do about all the other associated activities um, that, you know, that relate to these as, as settlements, as places where daily life activities took place. Um, so we've got John Blair saying that most of our knowledge is, 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 is really been um, related to keyhole glimpses. Keyhole glimpses that in most cases relate to the core of monastic complexes. And here we've got Chris Lovelock a few years ago saying that one of the key problems is that we don't have a good understanding of the, the lay settlements or the settlement context that were um, established around monastic cores. Clearly that limits our ability to understand and interpret the role of monastic monasteries in Anglo-Saxon society. And I think there are, there are two key areas or constraints <coughs> on interpretation. First off, because those glimpses are keyhole, it's very difficult to understand the overall scale and topographic texture of what were very complex um, and quite large settlements. So, trying to sort of piece together what the totality of a monastic settlement looked like. That's one problem. The second issue is trying to get a handle on the dynamics of monastic settlements, how they changed and evolved over time. And I think one of the, the key issues here is how their sighting and development was influenced by antecedent activity. So what I'm talking about here, in other words, is monastic foundation as a form of emplacement. How were they actually emplaced in the landscape in relation to what was there before? And how then did they change patterns of life? And of course, this is an area 
um, where archaeology can make a major contribution. So these are the sort of the key areas or gaps in understanding that the Limage project is trying to fill. Okay. So let's now home in a little bit more closely uh, to give you a handle on the regional context framing this particular project. Now Kent is the cradle of Christianity in Anglo-Saxon England. It's where we get the very earliest expressions of monasticism in an Anglo-Saxon context. And this is well known from the historical sources. Many of you will be aware of the iconic date of AD 597, when St. Augustine landed on the coast of Kent at the head of a mission sent by Pope Gregory the Great to convert the Anglo-Saxons. Kent has a very impressive array of ecclesiastical heritage dating to this early period, headed by the World Heritage Site of St. Augustine's Canterbury, which also includes um, the adjacent sites of Christchurch Cathedral and St. Martin's, um, which were all established during the period of St. Augustine's mission at the beginning uh, at the very end of the 6th century and into the early 7th. We've also got a number of sites within the Kentish locality um, that, that, that date to this period. Um, Reculver, a really evocative site on the north Kent of coast, um, on, north, on the north coast of Kent, um, and other remains. Now, if you actually evaluate the archaeology that's been done on these sites, it really epitomises that general pattern. Nearly all of the work has focused on the core buildings, and any work that's taken place outside the core of those buildings has been keyhole in nature. So in spite of this wonderful heritage that we have, we actually know remarkably little about the essentials of monastic life. What, how were these places actually organised? What activities took place within them? What was their economic basis? Uh, previous work, because of its nature, has been unable to answer these fundamental questions. It's also the case that Kent rep represents probably one of the best documented ecclesiastical provinces um, in Anglo-Saxon England. We've got a very good set of documentation, so-called Anglo-Saxon charters, that record gifts by kings to, um, to these monasteries um, at their establishment and thereafter, um, from which we can derive quite detailed evidence, particularly in relation <coughs> to um, their economic basis. We're able to characterise, in other words, the early Kentish church in a way that's simply not possible in other parts of Anglo-Saxon England, where we lack the charter records. And I think there's some, off from, that, from that information, I think there's some, some, some key characteristics that we can uh, highlight. First of all, the fact that most of the monasteries established early on were what, are what, what's known as double foundations or double houses. These mixed communities of monks and nuns placed under the rule of a royal abbess. And this is very much a pattern that's influenced by the Frankish continent. They're a close dynastic and high-level political links between Kent and the, Kent, and, and the Frankish continent at this time. We've also got um, the, the, these early establishments intimately evolved um, in the cult um, of their royal founders, their princesses, so their cult centres with shrines located at them. And another, I think, key point is that many are established at pre-existing centres that are already central places, important locales in the Anglo-Saxon landscape. Many were royal estate centres, or the word that, that, that early medievalists use it is, is royal villes. Because of that, we can examine monastic foundation as a dynamic process. Indeed. <laughs> Just getting back up there from, uh, from, the back, from the back of the audience. So, I'll draw out these key themes then. Um, in terms of the research context, and these are, these are integral to the research aims of the excavations at Limage. 
Because we've got that establishment of monastic foundations at pre-existing central places, we can examine monastic foundation as a dynamic process, as a form of emplacement, what I was talking about earlier. We can get a perspective on the double house, this quite distinctive expression of early monasticism in Anglo-Saxon England, and begin to explore how we can identify these places archaeologically, and also I put in there that something that we're, we're trying to examine through the archaeology is this idea that we, in, early, in Anglo-Saxon Kent, we might have a monastic network. Um, these institutions were founded within a relatively confined geographical locale at a similar point in the, in the development of early Anglo-Saxon Kent. To what extent you know, did they have a shared infrastructure and material culture? So that's something I think that we can begin certainly the archaeology can begin to address. So let's home in more closely at Liminge as a case study. Well, why Liminge? There are, you know, there, are, there are other sites in Kent that we could potentially target. What is it about this place that deserves the level of investment that we've, we've put into it over the last few years? Well, really key from an archaeological perspective is that we're looking at a relative...